How are you? So as I said, I'm just trying to take all this in and see your faces and how do you scroll? So many people that I actually know. I thought there'd be a lot of people that I don't know, but I, I know a few of you guys. So. And Susan, Happy birthday, see, Susan. My husband may join us, Susan, when he comes back from his meeting, if we're still in session. So. Okay. Okay. And I was saying to some people earlier, if you have to hop oh, off, you only want to be yeah. here, part of this. Um, I may need to, Susan. So I do want to make uh, make sure to get a chance to say happy birthday. Thank and, you. Um, and it's good. wonderful to see you. It's uh, ten o'clock. I'm living in Barcelona. Yeah, I saw oh, a picture. And, and um, it's ten o'clock here, so um, I'm going to need to hop off in a bit. Yeah, so those of you who are going to hop off to get some sleep or whatever, um, I'm going to record this whole thing and post it on uh, YouTube, and the link will be in my August newsletter. And if you don't get the August newsletter, you can subscribe by going to susancampbell.com. So I think we're supposed to, um, we should mute everybody now, and so I can... You Susan, you're muted. Yourself. Susan, you're muted too. So please unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, I can unmute myself, and then and then one of my hosts muted everybody else. So, um, does any just a couple of housekeeping things? Does anyone have a problem? If you have a problem, go ahead and raise your hand visibly on the screen and hold it up for a minute. Does anyone have a problem if I have a screenshot of this and I can't say what I'm going to do with the screenshot? I could put it on Facebook. Anybody have a problem with that? I'll check both pages. Okay. For those of you who do group facilitation on Zoom, I have learned that Somebody just taking a screenshot without asking permission can be triggering. So I want this to be an educational experience for everybody. I hope, <laughs> hope you're learning something already. So I'm, I'm still just getting here and taking this in. And I imagine some of you simply wanna offer happy birthday, acknowledgement of some sort. Will you do that in the chat? because that is not my intent for this call. My intent, it's a little risky, but it's actually self-indulgent. I, I love to be seen and heard, and I really like it when people are curious about me and ask me questions. It almost doesn't matter what your question is. I'll find something that I can do with that. And it's just an opportunity to step into the unknown together. And so I prefer that to giving a long history of my life and that sort of thing. But I am gonna start by saying something about my life now, and then I'll pause and people can offer. It, it, it doesn't have to be a question, but I'd, I'd rather have it be something where you're actually curious. But if you have something else to say, go ahead and put that in the chat too. So the protocol is I'll be speaking for a while, hopefully not more than a few minutes. And as a question occurs to you, put it in the chat. And then when we pause, I wanna introduce Sherry with the pink hair. Can you find Sherry there? Sherry is my co-host. She's like co-facilitator who will be helping me manage the chat. and. She'll pick questions from the chat and then we'll explain how that's gonna go in a minute once it's time for the questions. But the, the other function for Sherry is what we call vibes watcher. So if Sherry's noticing something in the group dynamic or something that, that I might not be aware of, she'll speak up and call attention to that so we can kind of course correct here. And Orv, is more my technical helper. Orv's in the, in my screen, he's in the upper left with a heart. You see the heart in his screen there? 
with the blue painting in the background. So Orv and Sherry are part of the authentic relating circling community and I've worked with, with both of them and their friends. So I guess starting by what my life is now. 80 which seems significant, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem like I'm old yet. I like to call myself old just for the shock value and to own it, to own that, you know, I really am old and certain parts of my body look much older than they did even five years ago. But um, it hasn't really hit me at this aging thing. So I just want to say that right, right off. I, th I think there will be a, a point in my future when I'm, I'm really going to start feeling loss of function and you know, grieving for more dying people and stuff like that. But none, none of that has quite hit me. And yet I've been really looking at the question, what are the developmental tasks of this final stage of life? And I'm kind of trying to milk that a little bit. So for me, a couple of the developmental tasks are coming to terms with things that I really can't do anymore or maybe need to slow down for. And the, the fact is I get out of breath going up hills. Like that's my biggest physical symptom of aging. And so I'll walk uphill for a while and I'll pause and I'll rest, that sort of thing. And, and an, another kind of program about developmental tasks of aging that I'm putting in my, into myself, even though it doesn't seem quite necessary yet, is rest between activities. So I'm sort of looking at the handwriting on the wall. It's like, Susan, if you don't learn to slow down and rest between activities, maybe you will have some physical consequences for not doing that. So I'm a, I'm a little bit of a planner and I can kind of feel that if, if I don't make adjustments, my life won't go so well. So I've always had this motivation to have like the best life I can possibly have. So, so that's all I'm coming up with right now for the developmental tasks of aging. And my main, my main um, sense of my life is I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to, for the pace I'm living at now, I'm really living a balanced pace between work, play, activity, rest, love and work. Uh, I'm basically living the life of my dreams that I've, that I've always wanted. I've got the man of my dreams. I've got a wonderful home, a property where I can grow food and great friends and community. And I've, I've always kind of been able to create community where people really help each other and uh, are like a family. So I'm thankful that I, I still have that here. So I, I, I think my, my, my overall feeling is I really have learned to balance in a way that I hadn't learned when I was young. Some of you who may be in your 30s and you know, I don't see too many people in their 30s here, but anyway, there might be somebody in their 30s listening to this later. Uh, that's the hardest time of life, I thought, because I was, my career, I had stepkids, I, you know, I just had a, a much bigger life than I, than I do now. And I always seem to be at a race against time. So some of you may still feel that you haven't made your peace with time yet. I never thought I'd get here, but I, I really feel at peace with the whole thing about, oh, getting things done, got to get more done and all that. Somehow for, for me, that's kind of huge. So I think, um, well, I want to say one more thing about my inner, my, just my inner experience of life is I, I've always been, and I still am just really happy, grateful, uh, interested. I don't, I don't spend any time wishing things were different than they are. I'm just that type of person who just says, okay, um, I don't like this, but what am I going to do about it? You know, sort of that angle on things. Um, 
so my my world is pretty much the same one day to the next i have different things that i do like seeing clients and giving speeches and workshops and stuff on zoom mostly but um you know if people ask me how i am i'm the same every day that's just that's just my my that's that's my inner reality i think maybe i'll just pause there to just see if any questions are coming up not necessarily about that but about anything and then and then we're going to get into maybe some things like well, experiences in my life major influences regrets stuff like that but you can ask questions about any of that that you saw in my little invitation starting now there's no order that this thing's supposed to go in but i did want to kind of start with where i am now so any questions, put those in the chat and make sure you have a name in case you get called on. There are a few questions in chat for you, Susan. Okay, let's give me one. Oh, okay. or give me, tell, tell me the name of the person and invite the person to mm -hmm. ask the question. That's the way we're gonna do these questions, folks. I, I said, right. I would tell you, okay. Well, there's a question and uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. So forgive me if I, if I blunder it a little, but um, Kiana Grace Faust. Kiana. Kiana. Would so you like Susan. to ask your question? Yes. So let me find uh, Kiana on the screen. It might be the next page. Kiana, I'm would you shake your hand or something so I can find you? There you are. Okay, because I, I want to connect with the people as we as we converse here. Kiana, thanks. Hi. Um, curious. You've been a pioneer your whole life, or at least the life I've heard of, and um, had such secure support and encouragement, and and led an extraordinary life. Um, I'm curious where you're hiring next. You know, you spoke to you know approaching aging with a but I'm curious if there's things that you feel like you still want to achieve or what your growth is in terms of where you're pioneering. Thank you. Um, Kiana's voice cut in and out. So I'm going to summarize the question. I think it's basically, where do you see yourself going next? Or do you have any more things that you want to accomplish in your life? Let's see. I feel pretty complete, frankly. I mean, my 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 instinctive answer is, uh, I could you know, I could die tomorrow in terms of anything I want to do or experience or get done. I just want to keep living the way I'm living right now. I like living. I like being in a body, and I want to say that. The amount of pleasure I can run in this body still at age 80 is amazing. So I don't want you guys to think people dry up and die. So I just, that just popped in there. Um, you know, it, it, you can have a, a juicy life all your life. But as far as future, no, I, I don't, I don't, there's nothing, nothing comes. <laughs> I always used to have things I wanted to do and achieve. And I think I just want to keep getting better at what I'm doing. I, I really am a, a learner, first and foremost. I think that's the, the, the biggest agenda that I have. And uh, self-development, deepen my experience of each moment. So I suppose the the prescription to myself would be the prescription that I'm offering to so many other people right now is pause, pause more, savor the moment. That's, that's probably my prescription for my future. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Kiana. And you want to dive into more questions now, Susan, or would you like to keep talking about your favorite topics? Let's have, let's have another question. I like these questions. Great. Um, Carol Dunaway, would you like to come on video and ask your question? And I want to find yes. 
Carol on the screen. So Carol, will you do something like this for a minute? While I'm I... waiting. Let's see. You're waving. Yes. I'll find you. Take Keep off waving. my glasses. Keep waving. <laughs> Keep waving. <laughs> All right. Oh man, Susan, that, just yeah. just there you are. Hi, Carol. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a better trick? Somebody was going to offer a suggestion. Yeah, just change to speaker view. Then whoever speaks will be oh, on oh. screen. Bang. Good one. Good one. Okay, I see you, Carol. Hello. Hi. Uh, well, thanks for all you do, Susan. Um, I'm just, I'm really impressed and um, I hope I can keep up, uh, keep up with you. Um, but I'm curious about your um, past history, like quite young. Where were you when you were very young as far as the relationships and that curiosity that you may have had that took you here? Oh, that's great. Um, so I'll just jump, you know, I'll jump to that piece in some things that I do want to share with you about the early influences, because I have a lot of gratitude for my early life and my parents. I'm just going to get a sip of water first. It seems my life has always been about relationships and culture change and creating a more harmonious world where we can all love each other and help each other heal. Um, so I, from a very early age, had an observer going, not just, you know, observing, you know, I try this, does it work? Does it not work? Does it get me more connected to, to people? Does, does it um, feel authentic to me, you know, just giving myself feedback, but I've been very uh, interested in the culture and the world. And even when I first went to school, I, I had this observer function. I was, I was five years old and I could notice the little strategies the teacher was using to help everyone feel included. Like if there was a one kid who um, seemed to be a, a bit unpopular or something, the, the teacher would use certain strategies to, to help that person feel better about themselves. And I would watch that and I would go to my, I'd say to myself, now that's a strategy, but boy, that is coming from such kindness. You know, what a kind teacher. Uh, and, and she's not exactly in, in, in the case I'm thinking about, she's, she's sort of manipulative in a way, but it was seemed like for a good purpose. So I'm a little distracted because I think there's an echo, but I think I can, I can ignore that. So here's the thing about my early influences, Carol. I had parents who were mature, ready to have kids, understood that, um, I don't know, they're not perfect. They don't have to, they don't have to be perfect the best thing they can do is kind of be honest with me and honest with each other. Uh, they, they had free attention. They, did, they weren't so hung up on their own problems like a lot of parents are. And so my early environment was very safe and loving. My parents had, had some flaws. I thought my mother was a little too shy and my father had an anger problem, but we could talk about it. My, my father would apologize to me if, if he popped off in anger. So there was just something, something I think kind of unusual, especially in 1941, which when I was born, for parents to be that enlightened. Uh, they read self-help books. So I think this is part of my having faith in, in the self-help movement. <laughs> Uh, they mean they they had this book called Your Inner Child of the Past. That was that was more when when I was a teenager they had that book, uh, but even young in my household there was books like Krishnamurti, the Tao Te Ching, and then there was uh, that bestseller Summerhill about uh, unschooling and about uh, child centered learning. My parents were all about child centered everything, and I lived in a 
I had three brothers and we lived in what I would call a child centered house. So we, it wasn't like we were controlled. It was like we were given a lot of permission and freedom to express. And I sometimes feel sorry for my parents for how much chaos we created, but it was wonderful for me. Uh, so uh, I, I watched my parents' relationship and that was probably a, another big thing that got me interested in relationships because they were very different and, and they were very respectful. And they, if, they, if there was a tinge of anger about something like, oh, Virginia always, forgets to bring things on a camping trip or something. And he, my dad would say, Virginia, why don't you make a list? And she'd go, well, I made a list, but I lost the list. And, you know, and they'd be able to joke about those kind of differences. And so uh, I kind of noticed that other families were not like this, that uh, there was a, a lot more it, it looked neurotic to me, you know, arguing about stupid things, name calling, blaming. I, you know, I witnessed that. I, I witnessed that with my grandparents on my father's side. I didn't think they were too cool at managing their emotions. So I, I just, as a young child, I began to have a view of almost like a better way to live. And that became my mission. You know, there's a better way to live. And then as I got older, uh, I was greatly influenced by uh, spending a lot of time in the US South where there were still the Jim Crow laws and the blacks were sent to the back of the bus. And my cousin and I, we said, this doesn't seem right. And this was down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This doesn't seem right. Let's us go sit in the back of the bus too. Things, things like that. I mean. My cousin Don and I did a, did a lot of things that kind of pushed the um, authority structure down there in the South because we, we didn't like it. And that would be when I was about maybe 11, 12, that age. And then right around that same age were the McCarthy hearings where if somebody called you a communist, you could lose your job, you could lose your right to work. And so, you know, I saw that kind of injustice. And then uh, I'm in high school and my boyfriend's in college and we're talking about air pollution and water pollution. You know, there was really a, a lot of industrial waste going into waters and into the air back then. I mean, we've got more regulations now and I know the whole climate catastrophe is worse, but there was an incredible amount of carelessness around the effect on the environment. So I, I understood from something my boyfriend had learned was they already had devices that could control pollution. And this was back in the uh, 50s, but they couldn't get them to market because of the power of the big corporations. So I began to get that kind of critical thinking about what's this world and why are we making such stupid decisions? And I've finally come to the conclusion that the problems, these are huge problems and they're very complex and they require people to get along and they require all, all these relational skills. And so I made it my mission to try to help humans develop the skills that we're gonna need or to deal with the complex problems that we're dealing with today because the problems are way above, I think, the, the pay grade of where we've developed. So I'm just saying a few of the early influences there had me become kind of what I kind of jokingly call a woman with a mission to, to really help systems learn from good communication between the subparts and the systems. So I, I know my main thing is couples and relationships, good communication there and what can you learn from that? But my, my higher purpose always focuses more on culture change. So I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, but just real shout out to the fact of, oh, one other thing, that the fact of having pretty adult mature parents. And I think I wanna say one more thing because I was in a woman's group a couple of weeks ago and I realized this thought, I had this thought, 
what if I had been raised in a more traumatized home? What if I hadn't um, had this particular advantage? What are the, what is the dark side of having the advantages I had? Because in a sense, I didn't have to get as sensitive as a lot of people have been traumatized. I didn't have to, I didn't have to notice. I mean, I was a great observer of the big picture, but I would tend to overlook, you know, little pouty things or little, you know, snotty tone of voice. Even now, Peter will come to me, my partner, and he'll say, I'm sorry for speaking to you in that tone. And I'll go, oh, you know, it just kind of went right over my head. So there's a deficit there in, in having great parents because it, it can make you less sensitive. And so I just always think, well, if I had a different childhood and I went on this different path, how would I be a, maybe a better therapist? So that's just a, a thought that came to me last week. Susan, there's a lot of really juicy questions Let's here. Let's go to the questions. Yeah, because I'm, I'm making long answers here. Because <laughs> you know, filling in the chunks of the pieces I wanted to share with you anyway. So let's keep going with the questions. I like that. Well, there seems to be a couple that are in line with what you're talking about right now. And even though there's some new places that I'd, I'd love to, you know, steer the conversation. Um, there's something here that's really interesting. You were just talking about how you were how you were raised and the differences in culture in society from when you were young to now. And so that really brings both a question from Liam and a question from Joe. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I wonder if they both wanted to come on and ask them and then you can kind of answer them together. One is a little bit more about the different you know, positionings of, of, of race and your experience of that and just you being young. So maybe Liam and Joe can come on screen and off mute and ask their questions specifically and maybe you can answer them collectively. And are you doing sort of a speaker view for me now so I can find Liam and Joe? Is that what you're doing for me? Hi, Susan. And I see Liam, I see you, 10, 10 right. p.m. in Barcelona. Yeah, so I was curious, uh, the, the question of race, the conversation about race has really been up, especially since the murder of George Floyd. And um, I'm curious about what similarities you see or differences to the conversation that we're having now, as opposed to what was going on in the 50s, the 60s, civil rights era. Well, the thing that uh, strikes me most to say, the thing that pain that pains me is there are um, so many different life experiences uh, that people bring to any problem. So let's call it the problem of, of, of racism, the problem of being afraid of people who are different because that's, that's to me, um, at, a, at a deep level, humans seem to fear something that's different. And, um, but, but then the, the, the one piece that I wanna pick up on, Liam, is then and now, I wanna pick up on a similarity, then and now, in terms of how I'm relating to allowing equal rights for all races, let's just stick with the race question, has an awful lot to do with the person's own life experience uh, and how they're conditioned. And so I, I don't think I have anything super you know, wise to say, but I wanna just see a, a, point out a similarity there that uh, People who have had, um, I'm now lately, not you know, more, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, talk to people about what you're in the South, you're, uh, rem you remember things like busing and you remember things like forced integration in the schools. And what were your actual experiences with that? And I, I have had, I've heard, 
people have their white, I'm talking really about white people who behave in what we would call a racist way right, right now that I would find hard to understand. If I really inquire into their experience, they've, they've had, some of them it's just conditioning and you just believe whatever was, was taught to you in your cu culture. But um, when I do stop to inquire and people who have a different way of seeing things than I do, they've got a story. And it's hard for me to relate to their story because it's so different from mine. But I think that's about all I want to say right, right now, because I, I don't have a lot to say in the, the, the big picture, but more just in, in my conversations dealing with people who see things differently than me. There's, there's always a story. There's always some kind of pain. It's, it's unfinished business. They haven't processed their pain. They're projecting their pain in some ways. But they actually have had some kind of painful experience at the hands of whatever it is, uh, a, 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 a Black person in authority or being forced, you know, having their kid um, having to be in a school where busing was going on. So um, I think that's, that's all I want to say right now is people just seem to have their own story and it it won't get dislodged until it is deeply listened to. And uh, that's, a, uh, <laughs> that's a long journey to really listen to these people, to help them listen to themselves. It's not my bag right now. It's not what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Does Joe have a question? Yeah, um, um, I, I just kind of like, popped into my head, it was this idea of cycles in life. And, you know, and so the generalized question was, uh, uh, what was it like being in your 20s in the 1960s? But, you know, it's like, what was it like being at the, at the emergence of yourself as an adult, you know, coming into this iconic time and speaking about it 60 years later from the perspective of moving into the twilight of your life? Yeah, well, um, I came of age during the Vietnam War era, and that was one big influence. Which, which I'll just I'll, I'll just name a, a couple of big influences. Also, the women's movement. Uh, I I very early read a lot of um, you know like the 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 first feminist bit that I read was uh, The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir. And, and then there was lots of lots of things that I educated myself there about. I personally never uh, felt like I was at a disadvantage for being a, a woman entering the employment uh, field. I, I, I was an educated person. And in that particular time in at least in education and writing like in higher education because I was a college professor and also I was being asked to do consulting for different companies and diff different cities communities and stuff there there was a desire to have more women's voices and a, and a real bias toward women so that was that was something I kind of wrote on the coattails of getting a lot of work opportunities that I don't think I would have gotten if I, if I hadn't been an, an educated, confident woman. Um, the, the Vietnam War, I was uh, deeply affected by that because I had a boyfriend who um, was uh, possibly gonna be drafted and also my younger brothers. So I just kind of struggled with people in that way and, um, and wound up doing you know, doing different professional things that would like counsel people how to become a conscientious objector. I started a counseling center that would just help people deal with their issues of how do you get out of the draft. So that that was one of my things that I was just inspired to do. There was so when I in the '60s, see, I got my PhD in 1967. There was so many problems that were so evident. And there was the um, LBJ was president, 
And he gave a whole bunch of money to public services and called it the war on poverty. And I went into the community of, of Northampton, Massachusetts, just as a brand new PhD and just looked around and said, well, this needs help, this needs help. So I got involved in things like training Head Start teachers, uh, training social workers to work more with um, welfare mothers who are learning to get back into the workplace. And so, it, and actually working on the street with hippies who were run away from their parents, it was almost like I had a, I had a psychology, psychotherapy office in a room, but I'd spend a lot of time out on the streets meeting with people. So it was just sort of that era where the way I, the way my life is now, it's just, it's just so much more um, safe <laughs> and predictable. I would just go into situations and say, well, this, this situation looks like it needs help. Let me let me go up. Let me go up to this Victorian and sit with this group of hippies who've all run away. They're 16 years old. They have they have no idea how to get along. So you know, doing kind of group counseling, but also let's call your let's call your parents and just let your parents know you're okay. And just what whatever was needed, I would just sort of respond. So that working on the streets like that was um, that was part of the 60s. Um, I mean, there were drugs, but I, I was more um, psychedelic. I, my first psychi three psychedelic trips were Stan Groff oriented trips. He was doing uh, psychedelic research with dying patients. And one of his assistants was a friend of mine. And so my first three LSD trips were guided trips where you just lay completely still, you have head shades, iPhones, and you just you just go into your inner felt experience and just keep going and going and see what you understand of the of the worlds that are beyond this perceptual uh, habit and so forth. And um, what I what came out of that for me was an understanding of how to do psychotherapy, how to do deep psychotherapy. And so I started a counseling center for people who were on bad trips because they wouldn't go to the the school counseling center. And um, it was a peer thing where we trained peers and we had people like Ram Dass and Stan Groff and Stan Krippner, people like that come and train our students. At, and so again, the, the theme was like, just get in there and do what's needed and figure out like the school's not giving them the kind of counseling they need for these bad trips because the school counseling center is not open at 1 a.m. This counseling center was open 24 seven. So th things like that, just, I was so excited in those days. I'm, you know, I'm less that way now, but it's fun to remember there were so many problems and that's probably why I got overworked and, you know, couldn't manage my time because everything I, so any problem I saw that I was invited to come in and help, I would just go for it. Um, and then there was the whole human human potential movement, which uh, that was just a, a marvelous opportunity. And I don't, I, you know, I don't want to go totally into that right now because I want to see what what other questions are there, but. Um, you know, I was I was like leading all night naked encounter groups with people twice my age when I was 25 years old. <laughs> I just if somebody asked me to do it, even if it was above my pay grade, I did it. And I'm kind of grateful for my willingness to uh, challenge myself that way. Any other questions? So many, <laughs> so many questions. I wonder if uh, Hiba wants to come on video and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Heba. Heba, thank you. I saw you wave your hand earlier. Hey Susan, happy birthday. Thank you, Heba.
Do you want to share your question? Being a lot of book, the self versus survival self. And I was wondering um, when you knew sort of what you wanted to do with your life and if there were like any external influences or any points where you felt, oh, this is a fork in the road. I could go this way, I could go that way, and this is how I choose to go. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to know if there were any moments like those and, and what kind of inspired you or... Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for that. One, one decision I made was to, to get a PhD because that would give me more power, more credibility, more doors would open. And I strategically, you know, if I want, if I want to have an influence uh, and I want to make it easier for myself, because a PhD is hard. It's a lot of work. It was a lot of anxiety and stress, but I knew once I got it, uh, a lot more doors would open and I was absolutely right. And I got my PhD young. Uh, some of the things that I, choices that I made were, you got the feeling of how excited I was looking at all the problems and let me roll up my sleeves and get in there. I went through college in three years because I wanted to get out there. And then I got my PhD in three more years. So, you know, I, I kind of hurried through school so I could just get out there and be a part of it. So one you know, real conscious choice was, do I get a PhD or do I go traveling like all the other people that are you know, in, in my age range and single and, and so forth. And <clears throat> another decision that helped me, but I didn't know it at the time, was to get married uh, at a very early age. So I, right after I got out of graduate school, I got married and um, I'm gonna say that kept me out of trouble with men because I, I've always been kind of boy crazy. Uh, I always was the kind of person that had a relationship going on and I love relationships. I love marriage. I, I, I love romance. Uh, I love the excitement of uh, being in love. And so that was um, a very strong motivator competing with the PhD. <laughs> so the answer, <laughs> if you want to dampen down your excitement about relationships, get married. <laughs> you know, it, it, I'm kidding about that, but it, it kept me in one place. It kept me monogamous. It, well, a little bit. I actually did have some affairs eventually, but, um, you know, it kind of kept me monogamous enough to um, complete a PhD. Uh, in terms of, I'm just trying to remember, is there any other part of your question there that, that I didn't get, Hebba? Because it was, it was a, the first part, I, I liked it, but I forgot it. Anything else? No, I mean, I was wondering if there was ever a time when you felt, okay, I'm going to cave into the to the way people do things and I'm going to do them that way, as opposed to maybe my way, because I just find you like a really inspirational woman. Mm -hmm. And coming from the Middle East, I find that a hard path to walk. Sure. So that's why I was asking the question, yeah, really. I hear you. I was raised to be independent, so uh, I, I was always kind of rewarded. In fact, just to give you an example, in high school, my father says to me, Susan, I don't know why a woman who's got as much going for you as you have would ever want to get married. So that's an interesting one. Wow. Another one, my mother took me to a lecture uh, with Margaret Mead, who is kind of one of my heroes uh, when I was about 17. And Margaret Mead said, there's a lot of different ways to be a woman. You don't all have to have kids, you know, and that's when I'm 17. So my, my parents, they just, um, they, they didn't, know. so I grew up in a household where you, you're not restricted who, who you are, or who you're supposed to be. Uh, my, my parents really supported my own personal self-expression and, and honored it. It was, I mean, when I was a little person, I was a little bit put up on a pedestal as somebody who was kind of wise and that that's kind of amusing, but um, they, they would write down the things that I would say, 
So, so I'm, trying, I'm trying to carry on that, that lovely moment with my parents the rest of my life here, <laughs> getting people to write down what I said. <laughs> yeah, so that's my answer. Thanks, Hippa. You've sure done a great job writing down the things that you <laughs> think and believe in all your books that we read. It's funny. Um, I'd love to turn to uh, Irva next. Thanks, Sherry. Um, Susan, this, I have a question that I asked you yesterday. I'd like to hear you talk about uh, like triggers and people getting into their story. And uh, I know you deal with a lot of people in that situation with clients, with classes. And uh, as a shared experience, uh, I also deal with people in my life <laughs> who get triggered, including myself. So how are you with, how are you able to help them uh, and maybe not get triggered in the same way? Like, how do you see them and, and yourself? How are you be able to, how are you able to be free and centered in, in those moments so when um people get triggered in my space uh i see i take triggering as a normal part of human relating so that's number one i i think too many people and and this is really the the purpose of why i wrote this last book from triggered to tranquil that's going to come out uh in august I think people give themselves such a bad time for the fact that, oh, I'm triggered and, oh, I, uh, I shut down or, oh, I made a fool of myself by getting defensive or talking too much or, or whatever, whatever your, your trigger response is. I, I think I've always just um, been interested in, okay, that's a trigger reaction and it really helps to be educated about it, like to understand that the brain has this survival alarm system that's always scanning for danger and things that don't make any sense to your, your audience are gonna, are gonna trigger you. And you know, my three of my books do a, deal with triggering and what to do to pause, to calm yourself. So, I mean, I spend, I won't spend too much energy talking about that here, but more my own self. Um, I, I just always, whatever shows up that's like painful or troubling, I, I see that as a beginning point for a deeper inquiry of what's going on here. You know, like I was kind of when Liam had the question about um, racism then and now, I didn't really answer his question, but what I was connecting to in my own experience is that is a moment when I'm um, having trouble connecting to somebody because their worldview is very different than mine. And that is a bit triggering for me, uh, that feeling of isolation, like we're separate, we're not watching the same movie. And so my and, and and when I'm triggered, what I'm doing in myself is I'm separate from some part of myself. So the key is attending to, leaning in, looking, looking for what's here, what are the feelings, what are the stories? And to me, that's just the natural, I, I think nature gives us all these tools already. Something gets your attention. Hey, you know, like pain gets your attention or frustration or anger. Go into it. Discover what's, what else is there. Discover all the different parts of you that have something to say about that. So to me, almost every like painful or frustrating moment is an opportunity to discover something more about what's going on in myself, in you, and uh, how can we connect <laughs> if we both become more present to what's going on in each of us, at least maybe we've got a chance to stop making that the other person's problem, you know, stop projecting blame onto the other and, and, and start really learning at a level that 
humans still have a very hard time learning. Uh, and, and that has to do with differences in worldview and differences in level of consciousness. I think that would be my, um, my cutting edge. If I was gonna live a, a lot longer and devote another uh, chunk of time, I, I remember, I think Kiana said, what's left for you to do? Something's coming to me now, which is communication across different levels of consciousness because that's what causes me the most pain. So then when we were talking yesterday, uh, you'd said you are with, you, you are uh, able to, you take people and see them like however they are, the way they are, you are able to be with that. Um, what, is, what is that like, you know, related to my other question? Can you speak on that? I mean, what's my life, what's my experience like to just accept people the way they are? Yes. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I would, uh, well, I'll just say this. I mean, each, each moment is different because sometimes I'll accept somebody the way they are, but I don't want to deal with them. It's going to be too much work for me. So um, I may be different than a lot of people would project onto me. Uh, in terms of taking care of myself. I, I, I take pretty good care of myself with regard to um, what kinds of relationships and conversations I want to put energy into. So um, sometimes I'll accept somebody as they are and I'll say, um, and we're not going to be friends. Some other, I'll, you know, an in, intimate friend, I'll accept them as they are. And I'll, um, we'll talk about it to a certain point, but I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to resolve every difference. I, I, I don't, I don't really know how to answer your question because every relationship is, is unique. But this, if I start with kind of like, okay, that's, that's the way you are. That doesn't, and, and like if it's an intimate or an important person, when I say accept you the way you are, it doesn't mean I might not uh, offer up some feedback that I uh, hope will have you look at yourself in a new way. So um, that, that question is very, is very big, but I think I'm able to pretty much accept whatever comes to me partly because of the work I've done with myself, uh, kind of accepting, I'll just put it in a psychological way, accepting all my parts. And I, you know, I've been working on myself since my 20s. I started to go to encounter groups in my 20s and um, I haven't stopped. Just intense working on myself, observing, noticing my reactions, uh, being interested in my own shadow material, things that I'm afraid of, that sort of thing. So, you know, it's like, it's life is easy when you have your whole goal to be learning more about life. What I'm really seeing, Susan, is uh, you talking about judgment, judgment of self. And when you soften your judgment to self, you soften your judgment of others. Of others, that's and, right. And, and in that space, um, I see you setting really healthy boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to bring Sam's question in if you have space for. Yeah. For more. Yes. Sam, do you feel ready to share your question with Susan? Sam Gabala. There is a really beautiful piece around how we be instead of do. Yeah. Yeah. Mom. Happy birthday, Susan. Um, I'm your fellow 80. I, I'm older than you by 11 months, so I can tell you what, what's happening a little bit, you know, in the future, not that far. Um, as, as I became 80, or maybe call it more mature or whatever, uh, I feel peace inside, and I feel like I'm floating, and everything is fine, uh, you know. Uh, yet the world outside is a doo-doo world. You know, um, 
So I, I moved from uh, being a do-do person to a do-be-do-be-do person. I try to do a lot of be. And recently I'm discovering that I'm more of a be person. And that is I'm a bee who kind of gets knowledge from one place and just take that pollen and give it to somebody else. Um, how do you handle that pressure on the outside of do do and, and things outside keep getting faster and faster, like, same like computers, everything doubles in speed in terms of interaction between people. Yeah, I know people say life is harder because life's more complex and changes is so rapid and exponential. You know, my life is easier than it's ever been. I don't have any issues about pressure. Um, let me think, let me think about pressure. I basically avoid pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I avoid situations that are gonna put me into pressure like deadlines and this and that. Um, I, I'll say I don't do, I don't, I'm going to say I don't do well with pressure, probably never have. So you uh, don't have to do do as much. You don't have as much do do to deal I with. Don't, I don't, yeah, no, no, I did have all that do do. Thanks, Brad Blank. I love you. <laughs> love the voice there. And uh, do, you, you recognize Sam quoting you, dooby dooby do there. <laughs> your, your, your words of wisdom have spread, Brad. Yeah, I don't. I, I guess I did feel a lot of urgency from the inside during the '60s and '70s and all the injustices and the you know, world shit. Then the world's even shittier now. Okay, in a way. I mean, the, the problems are more complex. I'm going to put it that way. They're much harder for humans to deal with, and our consciousness is not. Uh, rose to the occasion. I think the, guy, the gap between the problems and human capacity has gotten bigger. Okay, that's my armchair observation. But in the 60s, and when I had that other kind of energy, I was, um, I had that urgency about solving the world problems. I, I don't have that now. Um, I'm just kind of content with my piece, my piece of the puzzle. Okay. Thank you. There's some uh, really uh, great questions coming in on the tail of the last conversation we were having. And I'd like to hear your answer to Lani's question. Lani, Lani Jacobson. Hi, Lani. Hi, Susan. Happy birthday. Thank um, you. I guess you had mentioned going through shadow material in your 20s and you specifically you know one example said stuff you fierce mm -hmm. and i wanted to know if there's anything you're still afraid of now well, i'm afraid of physical harm you know and now i'm thinking when i was really working on my shadow a lot in my 30s i'd get up and write my dreams and all this and and i remember in my dream there was this motorcycle sort of tough, big villain. And <clears throat> it went around scaring people physically. And so there's some, there's still something in my shadow that I don't fully understand, but it, it has to do with me being scary and me being scared about physical harm, a large man. It, oh, wow. Like, I'm just thinking of one of my husbands, you know, he, he was a lot bigger than me. So I'd call him the giant and I'd go, Ooh, you know, the giant. Cause I mean, I was caricaturing it, but I am afraid of being physically attacked that. And most of my fears have always been on the physical realm, not on the emotional pain thing. I mean, I've had emotional pain and, you know, I've had breakups and I've had, you know, tons of heartbreaks and that. Um, and, and yet, um, that doesn't scare me. I can I can process emotional pain, uh, and especially now. So now I want to say something about being this age. Uh, probably I go through life with just a little bit more. Of course, I I stay in a pretty safe environment. You know, my house, Whole Foods, the gym, my friends' houses. And that's about that's my world. But. Um, uh, if I were more out in a world like a big city, 
I would be much more vigilant about what's around me that could harm me. So that's, that's still there. You ready for some more? Yeah. <laughs> Great. There's just so many questions here. And, I, and I'd like to just clarify something that um, there, there's been a few questions throughout this, this past hour where some of your friends are looking for more specific pieces of advice relating to their personal circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to qualify that I'm really looking at questions that get to reveal about Susan's life and her path. Mm -hmm. And if you feel that I'm avoiding a question that might be related to your personal experience, I just wanted to explain that, that that's intentional. And it was based on a conversation I had with Susan before today. Mm -hmm. So Susan, if you've changed your mind about that, let me know. But otherwise I am going to continue to kind of bring forward voices that are curious about you and your life path. Let's go with that, Sherry. Okay, great. Um, then let's get a question from uh, Darcy Frankel. Hi, Darcy. Is Darcy still with us? She was really curious about fulfilling experiences that you've had. And um, I'm happy to move on to someone who's with us at this moment. Maybe she took a pause. Um, yeah, something that Mary O'Connor recently asked is super intriguing to me. Oh, there's Darcy. Oh. <laughs> hi, happy birthday. And hi, everybody. <laughs> Doug sends his love to you. Thank you. He's working or he would so be here. <laughs> Um, okay, so it, it's hard to just say a little. <laughs> I'm having to pin all my appreciations and love, but I'll let that come through my voice. I'm, I'm curious about, um, you're sharing all these rich experiences, some of, you know, many of which I haven't even heard of. And what are some of your, uh, if you feel to share, what are some of the other pinnacle experiences in work, in life, all of it, that have been the most rewarding and fulfilling for you, mm -hmm. if you feel to share? Um, yeah, there are two things come to mind, and they're both professional. Um, but I'll tell you a little more about mar my marriages, too. I love marriage, you know, but that, you know, that that's there. <laughs> But uh, I love marriage. I love marriage so much. I've been married four times. So, um, but the two that pop in that I'm just so grateful that I had were um, teaching at UMass from 1967 to 1977 on the graduate faculty at a time when a professor could teach whatever they wanted. And it so it was a time when I would bring graduate students down to Northampton. You know, I told you I was like a social worker in the streets. I would bring them down with me to the, to the local jail where I was doing a, a group to get guys ready to go out with their families. Or I would, I would bring them into a school where um, I was meet, you know, teaching teachers how to deal with acting out children and you know, kind of mediating conflict between 10 year olds in a, in a live classroom. I would just bring my grad students with me. Uh, they let you do that. Uh, I had a basement, I had a, a fixed up basement. So I was just running Gestalt therapy groups in my basement that were like intense you know, for college classes, for college credit, you know, and, and, you know, it was a big community, big learning community, and everybody knew everybody else's business, and, you know, we all loved each other, and, you know, it was, uh, and, and there was a lot of co-teaching, and you'd co-teach, and then you'd clinic after you'd teach, or there's a lot of co-leading groups, and so, like at NTL, NTL is the place where T groups started, and it, um, it's now called the NTL Institute. It was then National Training Laboratories. And that was the East, kind of the East Coast 
slightly more business oriented version and Esalen was more the West Coast, much more shamanic in its flavor, I would say. Uh, back then, things have totally changed and NTL's hardly on the map anymore. But being able to be in an encounter group as the leader for two solid weeks, you're living with these same people day in, day out, morning till night, and then you're partying. Um, I mean, that kind of intense learning community you just couldn't get anything better. I mean, those are the high and, and the, the, the group just the groupness, the, the group synergy, the, the consciousness of what of, of the whole group, you know, the consciousness of the whole while dealing with problem parts. You can't you, you can't learn about group process and really develop a group in the short amounts of time that most like businesses will will pay for their people to come anymore. A lot of these were paid for by their businesses, managers and stuff, clergy. Um, so just that opportunity was hu was huge, uh, and it had to do with in my story. It had to do with the economy. The economy has g gotten so oppressive now. It takes so much to just pay your mortgage. It wasn't always like this, and people had more free time. It seemed like I mean I have more free time now. But most people had more free time to devote to their personal growth than they do seem to have now, at least in general, you know, people have all this pressure to make a living all the time. That wasn't so central in the, in, at least in the subculture that I lived in, in the, in the sixties and seventies. Mm -hmm. So uh, those were two great blessings for me was just life is one big encounter group. <laughs> And I loved it, you know, but there was nothing like it is now, even with the groups, you know, like there was, there was nothing like boundaries, <laughs> sexual boundaries, any kind of boundaries, you know, I mean, if, I mean, sort of like it was a subculture. If somebody said, hey, Susan, let's fuck, I'd, I'd either say yes, or I'd say, no, I'm not, I'm not into it. And that would be that, you know, but that kind of conversation was allowed in that subculture. I'm not saying it should be allowed now. First of all, it was a subculture and it wasn't mainstream. Uh, most of us were psychologists. In, in those days, I didn't know how to relate to non-psychologists. My whole world was people who had done a lot of personal growth work. And so they were a little more emotionally resilient, you know? So I think that spoiled me a little bit for, for um, having to learn through my own experience that um, it really is a lot of work for a lot of people to develop boundaries and say no and this sort of thing. Um, but anyway, it just, it was a different world. It was the wild west <laughs> and I'm glad I was there. <laughs> and I see, I see Brad laughing. <laughs> uh, did, did I answer your question? Yeah. Did you have fun? <laughs> it was totally fun. Oh, but I wanted to say something about marriage just because I, I said I love marriage. This wasn't your question at all, but the opportunity to have four different marriages is another, another high point in my life. Uh, really getting deep with somebody because I, I, I married people who were emotionally available, you know, I mean, people say, oh, where are all the men who are emotionally available? Well, I, I, the men I picked were emotionally available. They might have had other problems, but. Um, I had five, Susan. So. You had five marriages. Yeah, I'm slower. Isn't it great? Isn't it great? Yeah, it, is. <laughs> it really gives you perspective because when you know somebody, yeah. you know their triggers that intimately, you really know that not everybody is wired up the same. Yeah. You get over that myth, you know, people are basically like me. Well, you know, that takes, it should only take one marriage for you to get that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I think I love marriage because it forces you to stay in it for a while, even though I didn't stay in it forever. It does, you know, I took it sort of semi-seriously that, you know, this is a marriage. This is not just a, an agreement. 
And um, plus there's legal complications getting out of a marriage. Uh, but anyway, um, something that, some container for forcing you to deal with your shit. And you know, I wrote that book, The Couple's Journey when I was, geez, uh, that's, that's about relationship as an inner development practice. I was, uh, I was in my early 30s when I wrote that book. It didn't come out until my later 30s, but, um, you know, because I'd already had a couple of marriages under my belt. Okay, those are, those are my uh, highlights of my life. <laughs> There, there was a question from um, Evelina relating to how you managed to have so many amazing lovers in your life. And uh, I, I was going to steer us in a different direction, but I don't know if you want to give any attention to I that. Give a little attention to that. I <laughs> like men. You know, I think some women are, you know, just have an ambivalent relationship to men. I just 100% and, you know, and I'm hetero, you know, uh, so I, I think men feel safe with me. Mm. And people would project, oh, you're so accomplished. Aren't they threatened? I've never had that issue. I can be as assertive as I want. Um, no one has, no one that I have been interested in has been um, intimidated by me. When I'm in an intimate relationship, I'm really not that intimidating. I'm very sweet. Peter, are you on this call? <laughs> I have to get affirmation from my current partner, um, who is, by the way, the man of my dreams. And there will there will be no marriage, but there also will be no divorce until we die. Because I, I just mm -hmm. feel like finally, finally, mm -hmm. I can just rest in a relationship that is um, that is not marred by uh, I'll call it pockets pockets of uh frustration that i can't i can't handle levels of frustration that i can't handle okay i'm peter does not frustrate me mm, beautiful thank you <laughs> wonderful um i i do want to say that when we started this call, Susan, there were a lot of questions uh, from Kathy Duke, from Liz Rave, from Stephen Page, from Robert, all, all curious about your physical and mental exceptionality. <laughs> like, how is it that you've maintained your, your mental sharpness and how have you um, maintained your physical well-being, your you know, everything from your, your looks and um, your capacity in all those realms. And I, I didn't want to ignore those questions, but because that I kind of saw four of them mm -hmm. around that same theme, it felt like something worth giving attention to. And um, if, if any of you want to come off mute and fine tune the answer you're looking for, I, I would invite any of you that I named to do so. My gut feeling is just to speak to that question because I don't have a lot to say. Okay. So how have I maintained oh, you want me to mute again, then? this physical? Uh, yeah, but maybe after I've said my piece, then Liz, I will um, say, is there any more with that? Because I got a real short one here. Um, how have I maintained my physical uh, thing that I you know as best I can here? As well as I've done, I think I've done well. Um, diet and exercise. <laughs> I mean, I say that jokingly because that's the answer nobody ever wants to hear. Is my story. Um, I do have something in me that seems to naturally gravitate toward things that are good for me. I mean, and you might say, "Well, what about those marriages? They were good too. They were good." Um, but uh, back to the physical, yeah, I just, I'm a sort of a basically you know, practical efficiency oriented person. So I don't tend to do things that's going to create karma for me that I've got to then work off the karma, you know, like, I mean, I did have a, a food, a food addiction problem for a while, compulsive eating, um, but it was never that bad. It was, you know, like, 
five pounds, you know, I would put on and I would, I would emotionally eat. And uh, so I, you know, I went through that. I studied myself through that and uh, that's completely gone. That was in, that was in my forties. I didn't have that when I was young, but it, it, I think it came up because of an unhappy marriage situation. Um, but basically my, my whole story is I pretty much want what's good for me. So that's the physical. The mental, and then I'll see if you have more question, Liz. Um, the mental would be just, I, I, don't, I don't worry about my mental capability. I don't think about it. You know, like a lot of people my age are worried about memory loss, losing, losing their marbles. I don't, I mean, I might, but I don't worry about it. I just use, I use my mind in novel ways all the time because I do continue to challenge myself. I'm aware that my life is easy. It's always been sort of easy and I've gotten in the habit of, of mentally and kind of professionally challenging myself. So I still do things that um, I don't know if I can do them or not like speaking to a corporate audience. And I think, what do I have to tell these people? Geez, these are truck drivers, you know, or something like that. I mean, where I have self doubts, I still go into situations where I'm not 100% uh, confident. And I think that keeps your mind active. Any uh, comments, Liz, or questions? No, thank you. I think you answered my question. Okay, nice to see you. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you. Happy birthday. Thanks. Great. Susan, I'd love to hear from uh, Mary O'Connor. She had um, a wonderful question, something you uh, track back to your upbringing that you mentioned that I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Hi, Susan. Hey, Mary. Happy birthday. Yay. Oh my God. So happy to see you. Um, I was wondering, cause I, you know, I'm very, very curious how you got to be where you are and all the sh cool shit you've done. But the main thing that it's intriguing to me is, you know, you talked about your parents putting you about on the pedestal and kind of, you know, putting a lot of attention on you as a little girl. And I'm so curious, you know, because so many of us have not that experience of being adored and, you know, cherished. And I was wondering if there's other significant things that happened for you that, that kind of gave you this confidence that you could do what you wanted with your life and feel like, you, you know, like life is easy for you. I mean, that doesn't come to most people. Most of us have to figure that out. And I'm just curious if there's, you know, other things that happen, especially with your family of origin that happened or didn't happen that gave you the, the possibility of being so free. Probably stuff that didn't happen, you know. I had a very uneventful childhood, really. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was an only child for seven years. So I got to be the center of attention for a very long time. And I lapped it up. <laughs> uh, so I just, you know, I remember being put on the stage a lot when I was really little to give speeches or sing songs, or I was on the radio, I think when I was two singing songs. And then I, I um, was on, TV a lot when I was 10, um, doing commercials on TV. And I always thought that I might, my future might involve some TV because it seemed like a good way to, you know, really reach people. But as, the more I got onto different TV shows and saw the pressure, especially live ones, you know, all the pressure, uh, I didn't, like I said earlier, I didn't like pressure. Uh, and the consequence, you know, if you say one bad thing, you know, the consequences are so terrible. I just didn't want that stress. So I, I, I did have my own um, reality TV show for about six months in the early 2000s called mm -hmm. Truth and Love. But that was different because that was pre-recorded and edited. And that had, that had no pressure at all. The reason I quit that was um, they wouldn't let me have uh, control over 
editing the footage. So mm. I thought their footage that they were selecting to, to show people being truthful or trying to be vulnerable on a date. That's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were, the footage that they were picking was so superficial and, yeah. and you know, they wouldn't listen to me, so I quit. But uh, basically the, the early, early life experiences, yeah, being an only child. And then, and then I was ready for a brother and I told my parents I wanted a brother and um, boom, I got a brother, you know, so that, <laughs> Weirdly, I mean, it was, of course, nothing to do with me, but I mean, it was at that point, I had enough of an observer going that right. I could actually see that it wasn't about me, but there was also this little flavor of, I live this magical life. Yeah. You know, I'm in the flow and I do feel that way. So, you know, beliefs about my life, uh, you know, I'm going to have a good life. I planned, you know, I guess I'm a planner too. And I thought about how I wanted to be, you know, I saw people who were alcoholic. I didn't, I didn't want to be anywhere near that dynamic, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I worked with alcoholics with, with, with great compassion, but just my whole at very early age, you know, seeing a girlfriend's father, who's an alcoholic, I said, Oh boy, that's not for me. And so mm -hmm. I was always sort of, and what kind of a person do I want to be when I'm older? Mm -hmm. oh, I, I, I had a vision of that. I didn't necessarily have a vision of my accomplishments. Mm -hmm. I never really thought I'd write books or, or even necessarily be a college professor, but I, I wanted to be, a really wise, mature, good person. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. I'm wanting to leave enough spaces for the pauses and I'm also so keen to bring in more voices and, and have you respond to everyone. I'm watching the time and I'm seeing that we've got eight minutes left if you're going to stick with this 90 minute window is that how you're feeling about time today susan yeah let's let's call it at eight minutes from now i mean i'm i'm uh i'm going strong <laughs> <laughs> i uh i don't know i i think we probably should call it you know enough is enough <laughs> of me i don't want to be too piggy <laughs> Maybe I'll do this again sometime, you know, I'm, I'm totally enjoying this. So go ahead. Well, I love that Evelyn wants a little bit more of a peek, like inside your heart. And, uh, and I wonder, Evelyn, if you're still with us and willing to speak your question. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I'm curious about when you mentioned what a few, you had a few breakdowns and heartbreaks and your process. I mean, I, at one point I did have one and, um, and you have so much wisdom and I thought maybe we could learn something from you. <laughs> well, first my thought that comes is none of my heartbreaks have been that bad. The worst heartbreak was when I was in eighth grade, honestly, and, and that's so superficial and, and childish that I don't even want to talk about it. I mean, it's, it's not it's not really a part of who I am. Um, I guess the biggest was uh, my second marriage. We had kids. We had his brother and sister staying with us. And the biggest heartbreak was hurting the kids. I mean, some of you have been through this. It's, you know, I mean, I would just, my gut would be in knots sometimes knowing that this marriage was not working and talking to him about it. And um, honestly, the thing that drove us apart was he was not interested in sex with me at all. Now that may, at a later age, you might say, why, you know, I mean, weren't there other underlying things? We got along great. I mean, we had marriage counseling. We, we looked at all that, but he was so overwhelmed 
with trying to get his PhD. I already had mine. Uh, and he just, you know, it's just every, he just had no bandwidth for anything except the bare minimum of what life uh, was requiring of him. He was like, I would call him an overachiever. He was living in a world that was above his pay grade and um, trying to do more than he was, I think, talented enough to do. Uh, but you know, I loved him dearly, but he didn't want to have sex with me. So I, I chose to end the marriage. But the, but the angst, so I guess there's two forms of angst, feeling sexually rejected, which I definitely went through that, uh, and just plain old frustrated. And, um, but the kids, uh, so I guess that's one of my deepest uh, times of, all I can say is angst, you know, I'm, I'm clenching my hands like this. I can't, if I go, if I have what I want, I'm going to hurt two other human beings. My, my husband was kind of okay with the divorce idea, but, and the, the kids weren't that young. They were nine and 11 and they had parents. They had, per, you know, kind of, you could almost say perfectly good parents in the next town, but they weren't perfectly good parents. That's why they were, that's why they were living full time with Ron and me because they had, things going on emotionally and mostly emotionally. So we took the kids. So yeah, I, I, I don't think I have any lessons there. I just want to say um, that's one of the hardest things in the world to choose yourself and know you're going to hurt somebody else and how you work that through with them afterwards is an important, important piece of life. I deal with lots of clients who are struggling with that issue. It's a big one. A couple of quick questions. Um, what's your favorite romantic movie? Robert wants to know. I don't, nothing comes. I'm not, I'm not a favorite movie type person. Okay. Barton asks, what makes you laugh out loud? Every day I laugh with Peter, um, usually at my own jokes. <laughs> But it's so wonderful. That's why I love relationships because I like a constant audience and I'm a good audience too. You know, Peter likes a good audience too. And so to be with somebody who is, I'm going to say um, emotionally and mentally there and embodied, of course, too, that's part of the whole thing. But um, I mean, it's just one laughing matter after another because it's mostly about just little habits that we see ourselves doing those are the things that we make jokes about as we go through life nice and and something to end us with here um kind of a pay it forward susan i know i know i'm here because i consider you to be a mentor and a question here from justice van tyler would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, I would, if that's all right. Susan, happy birthday. And uh, thank you for selecting my, my, my question. Um, I, my question was about uh, your mentors and maybe your spiritual role models. I was curious mm -hmm. about um, them and how they affected your life and uh, maybe some decisions that led you uh, deeper into the work that you do now. Good. Um, first of all, just just uh, role models that weren't mentors, and and then a little more about mentors. Uh, and this will be our last question, and we'll kind of wrap it up with something. Uh, my early role models will be Jesus, the real Jesus, Martin Luther King. Uh, Margaret Mead, Gandhi, and a little bit of Bertrand Russell. I want to say something about Bertrand Russell. <laughs> when I was 10 years old, I, I read his autobiography, and he's an atheist, and um, he wrote about how um, he's lived his whole life to be able to just live his unique self, and the, what gives him 
uh, sort of the freedom and nobody's bugging him too much. Because back in those days, I guess people would bug you about being an atheist. Uh, certainly not true in my world today. Uh, <clears throat> but he said, I've lived my life to contribute to the common good enough so that I have gotten a license for lunacy was a phrase he used. And I'm 10 years old and I'm reading this book and I'm saying, that's what I want. So just, just, just letting you know that, that piece. And then, um, boy, mentors, a lot of them. Um, I was friends with Carl Rogers. So Carl Rogers was a mentor. Um, Fritz Perls was not a mentor, but he influenced me and I was in his groups. Um, I, I, would, I would say spiritually, I, I was part of the Gurdjieff work for many years. Um, one of the things that comes out of that, although it already fit with my personality, was in Gurdjieff, the concept of conscious shocks. Conscious shocks is, is like, uh, if you're afraid to, to do something, or if something's uncomfortable, step into it or do, do things that are uncomfortable in order to stretch your comfort zone, okay? And so I, 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 I live by that. Um, I practiced various forms of Buddhism for a long time and would go on long retreats and sit sashin by myself. There's no real mentor there. I've had several you know, Buddhist teachers, but I, I wouldn't say that I, I got a lot out of them so much as just the practice. And radical honesty has been a big influence in my life. Brad Blanton's here, and I'm a trained radical honesty trainer. And, you know, he and Fritz Perls together, because he's kind of brought a lot of Fritz Perls's ideas into the mainstream, as, as I have done. Uh, and then let me just see if there's any, um, I, I, you know, I've been more of a mentor to other people since an early, as, at a very early age, actually. I started mentoring women right away when I got my PhD, because I, I really saw there weren't a lot of uh, adult women to mentor younger women. So I honestly, I, you know, I wish I had more women mentors. You know, that's that's what's coming up for me, and um, it just is. It just hasn't been my story. Um, but I have a great mother. She's dead, but I'm. She's very wise. She's just a s super grounded, earth mother, wise person. So, you know, she probably is my greatest influence in the whole world. Seems like a pretty amazing place to end that kind of full. And I want to end with thank back, you. Back to mother. Thank you, Mom, thank you, Dad. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 it, not too many days go by when I don't offer gratitude to them. It's beautiful. So now I'm teaching people how to reparent yourself because I really know what it feels like to be a good parent to myself partly because so this will be my closing thing here. <laughs> ta-da, my ta-da is, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've worked hard to be a good mother to myself, but it's also came kind of naturally because I had good mothering for the most part. There's stuff in the book getting real about how uh, I, I was a little bit traumatized at the, bre at the breast and that sort of thing. Um, but, af you know, after the breast, <laughs> after the breastfeeding phase, you know, everything's been pretty damn easy. Um, so this good mother, bringing in the good mother archetype and helping us all be better mothers to ourselves and one another, I think is a good way to wrap this up. That's, that's kind of what my life's been about. So thanks so much. And um, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Thank maybe, you. maybe when I turn 90. <laughs> Susan, when you have time, when this uh, call ends and you get to read all the comments, you'll see how many people were hoping for the same thing. More of this, this again, yes, please. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm, I'm, totally, I'm totally into it. So um, 
you might have to sign up for my newsletter to get the notice on this because I sent this out sort of ran, I sent it to my newsletter and Facebook, but I basically sent it out sort of randomly. And a lot of people who got an invitation are not on any of my lists, but I would like to do this again. So that's how you'll find out about it. Right. Thanks so much. I, I really am nourished by spending this time with you on my birthday. Love you, Susan. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, happy happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Susan. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Susan. Happy birthday, Susan. Happy birthday, Susan. Happy birthday. 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 Happy birth